the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, episode 683 for Tuesday, November 14th, 2017. Yeah, greetings, folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show where you are going to learn at least four new things each and every time we get together because we answer your questions, we share some tips, we share some cool stuff found, and that's how we make it to our goal. Sponsors for this episode include the new BB Edit 12 from Barebones Software at barebones.com, stamps.com, where you can visit stamps.com, click the microphone, enter MGG, and you get a free trial and all kinds of stuff that we'll tell you about in a minute. And harrys.com slash MGG, where you also get a free trial and you can shave yourself with it. We'll talk about that in a few moments as well. Here, back here in Durham, New Hampshire, after a weekend in Austin, Texas, I'm Dave Hamilton. Uh, and here... Back here after popping into Manhattan for a mini CES like event here in Fairfield, Connecticut, John F. Braun. How you doing, Mr. John F. Braun? Good. 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 Keeping warm. Good. Yeah, I was going to say it, uh, it got colder here while we were gone. And we were only gone like f- five days or something, but it, you know, it's how it goes. Tis the season, as we say. Uh, let's dive right in, shall we, John? We'll just get right into it. Uh, Phil has a question. He says, uh, my AirPods, when connected with my MacBook, the audio cuts out for like a second every 10 seconds. He says, I surmise that it is my Bluetooth module in my MacBook. So, yeah, it, I mean, it, it could be that there's something wrong with your Bluetooth module. It could be something wrong with your AirPods. But... It could also be a conflict between Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, very specifically in the MacBook. And I, you didn't say what vintage, but I think this is true for all, if not most of them. Uh, there are multiple antennas in that MacBook for 2.4 gigahertz radios. And your MacBook decides which one to use for Bluetooth and which one to use for Wi-Fi. And it will bounce that back and forth, prioritizing, as I understand it, the Wi-Fi uh, on the most, you know, on the on the best one for that particular connection and then shoveling Bluetooth connections off to the other 2.4 gigahertz antenna. But, of course, that could cause if that keeps happening, if, if Wi-Fi for some reason keeps bouncing back and forth between the two, that could cause interference, especially given the tight tolerance in terms of, you know, very little buffering and all that stuff with the AirPods so that you get near real time sound and, and all of that good stuff. Uh, so my advice would be if you can jump to a five gigahertz radio uh, for your Wi-Fi and see if that helps. If it does, then you know, that's, uh, you know, sort of where the problem lies. Uh, if you can't maybe changing the Bluetooth channel or even just temporarily just for troubleshooting sake, reorienting your MacBook so that one side of it is sort of definitively closer to your router and, and see again, if that helps, that'll at least let you narrow down. If, if this switching thing is the issue, I don't know, but that's what I think, John, what do you think? I think I'm going to tell you what Apple thinks and Apple thinks that you should read a support article called potential sources of Wi-Fi and Bluetooth interference, which we will link to in the show notes. I uh, just, popped in there for you cool and they talk about a lot of things you did um the basic problem is the 2.4 gigahertz is a mess well it's crowded (laughs) yeah and there's all sorts of things so your your suggestion and and they they hint at this too is you know if you can get as many things out of there as possible i think that's uh and they mentioned some other things some may surprise you that also generate 2.4 other computer peripherals um yeah again it, it gets real crowded so yeah. I, I think you have the uh, the best advice there, including repositioning things. I mean, that can never hurt, right? No. Well, okay. I mean, <laughs> it, it can. It can totally hurt. But that's sort of the point is just start, you know, one by one changing things and test and see. The, the nice part is, of course, the, the same thing that's very frustrating. This happens routinely and frequently. 
So it's not difficult to test for, which is sort of, a, you know, a blessing when you're troubleshooting things. But it's frustrating when you're trying not to have to troubleshoot and just get work done or listen to music or whatever it is you're going to do. So, yeah. All right, John, you want to take us to Karsten? Yes, I will. All right, let's see. Karsten. Okay. Um, My wife has her own travel agency business and upgraded from an iPhone 6 to an iPhone 8. She used her iPhone 6 with a wired headset and she used the lightning port for charging. All right. Um, With a new iPhone 8, she can only charge the phone or plug in the wired headsets. True. Question, do you know of a way to still charge an iPhone and have a 3.5 millimeter slash lightning wired headphone connected? I tried a wireless charger, but that uses a low charge and is not enough. She does not want AirPods because they do not always connect fast enough when she wants a client to when she wants to take a client's call and they run out of charge. She places one AirPod back in the case and takes the other one out, but it does not work for her. Really prefer a wired charge and wired headphones. I tried all sorts of adapters from Amazon. They all charge the phone, but phone calls are not routed to the headset. You can listen to music, but not use it as a headset. Any advice is appreciated. And I got exactly. So this is the talk of the town um, when the seven came out, because this is a feature that they uh, introduced, if you will, <laughs> and that there's not a 3.5 millimeter jack for a headset anymore. And believe it or not. So uh, I have one too, Dave. So I still have an analog headset and I use the adapter that came with the phone. But as pointed out, I mean, you mean a wired headset? Yes. So I have a wired yeah, okay. headset that goes into the 3.5 millimeter to lightning yep. adapter that then plugs into the phone. And that works. Which I great. guess is also an analog. Uh, uh, saying analog is, is not incorrect. I just wanted to kind of get you know, frame. Yeah. It but it's a wired, wired headset. Yeah. Um, well, the answer is pretty simple. So, so I did the same thing. I bought an adapter and I'm like, well, I, ju- I should just need a, you know, like a lightning splitter kind of gizmo. And sure. I saw one on Amazon and I'm like, oh, well, let's try that. And I ran Perfect. into the same problem. Uh, it has to be di- designed very specifically to put audio through one port and power through the other. And the device, it's pretty straightforward here. It's the Belkin Lightning Audio and Charge Rockstar. I don't know what makes it a rock star, but... Well, it, the, maybe the fact that it does what you're asking it to do. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's it. And I think uh, the retail from them is uh, uh, 40 bucks, and uh, you may be able to get it for less uh, elsewhere. And that does it for me. Seven on Amazon. How much? 3307 on Amazon. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it lets the, uh, the iPhone 7 kids get in on the whole... Uh, you know, needing uh, dongles <laughs> to do anything useful. Yeah. Uh, club, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, well, no, I mean, I, I don't have a dongle like that. Uh, and I happily can use a wireless headset, which is what, it's, what I've been using for several years. I, I used to use wired headsets, but, uh, but I got sick and tired of having to walk around with my phone. I, I like to walk around when I'm on the phone in the office. So for a while I used a Plantronics headset and, uh, and now of course I use the AirPods cause they are in that sense, the best wireless headset I've ever used. They sound good. They work well. Um, yeah. But, but they're not that, inexpensive. And now you mention it, that was probably the thought process with the seven. They're like, you know, Hey, all you dinosaurs stop using wired stuff. Right. Right. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And my last experience with the Bluetooth headset and, you know, just, I mean, we just had a Bluetooth question about problems with Bluetooth is, uh, you know, I'll I'll have to revisit it. Yeah, it works pretty well. I also, um, depending on which wired uh, headset you have, uh, you might be able to get one that has a charging port built into it, like those um, Pioneer (sighs) Rays headphones. They are lightning port headphones like the, the That's the only thing that these will plug into. And in addition to that, being able to give it some really kind of smart functionality because it it's got a chip in it and it's connected digitally to your your phone or your iPad. Um, they put a little port in the cable that you can plug a lightning cable into for charging purposes only. So I can plug these headphones in and uh, and still charge my phone or charge my iPad. I, um, I was, you know, I was using the rays on the plane last night and it's, they're great. 
They they sound so, um, charged. You know what? The only thought that I have about that, Dave. Yes. Is that if a, someone like Pioneer could build something like that, couldn't Apple have made their adapter have a charging port in it? Sure, of and course I think they technically could. they yes, could have, but they of didn't. course, <laughs> yeah. They so Belkin can make a product, <laughs> right? Right? Yeah, they could have. Yeah, yeah. But they just, you know, I mean, there's a lot in that little thing, right? There's a little DAC in there and and everything. So yeah. I remember, we, 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 uh, yeah, well, I think it, it came uh, or was available for pre-order. I think at the last CES, and and I didn't pre-order it. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's another solution. Uh, yeah, she may want to give those a try. Yeah, I'll put a link in the show notes stuff yeah. cool uh in the last episode we had some conversation uh i shared my my crazy theory about doing a wipe and restore on your iphone as effectively a way to clean caches and functionally as a way to get your iphone running a little more efficiently and battery life would be improved and sure enough many many of you have written in and said that that worked. So I'm I'm glad that that we went down this path together because uh, that's important. However, uh, some of you have not had it work until you did something else. And listener Scott wrote in and he said, I tried it, but it didn't seem to make a difference. He said, but then I decided to calibrate my battery and he said, but it only lasted six minutes after hitting 1% before shutting down. So it, essentially calibrating the, the battery in this sense, we're talking about just letting it run down until it literally turns the phone off and, and then plug it in and charge it all the way back up. Uh, we've had several of you. In fact, we mentioned it in the last episode where it went, you know, almost an hour before dying from one. And, and that calibration matters. But even in Scott's case, where it only lasted six minutes before hitting one percent, he says, uh, now, after doing both of those things, he says, my battery life is significantly better. And he says, my Bluetooth problems have almost gone away. So, of course, that doesn't make any sense correlating with these other two things. So it might be something different, although it might not. Your Bluetooth problems might have been something where the wipe and restore helped. But we've certainly seen that uh, in the past. So, and he said, uh, he sent us that report after five days. He said his battery life is now very usable, maybe as good as iOS 10. He said, I haven't hit 20% in five days and I used to always hit it. So, and, and, and Scott, you're not alone. We we've heard from other folks too. And for, uh, and this is the, the crazy thing about experimenting, you know, you don't know until you have a control group. I routinely would let my phone die get down to 1% and then just let it die. And then, okay, I'll plug it in. So my phone was already calibrated in that sense before I did this wipe and restore. So I did both things and I saw this great increase in battery life. So I think uh, certainly at least those two things are related to this with iOS 11. Perhaps there's yet another factor that we're not aware of, but, uh, but I did want to share that. So thanks Scott for, for, uh, for chiming in with us on this. Any thoughts on that, John, before we. I'm almost certain that at some point in the past, so a Apple still has a, a section on their site. I don't have it in front of me right now, but I think in the past they used to suggest. Yep. On a support page that you uh, calibrate your battery, you know, bring it up, down and up. Well, that was true with the MacBooks. I don't think they've ever suggested that for iOS devices, but I could have missed it. You're, mm. you're certainly more in tune right. with knowledge base articles than me. Yeah, I thought that you could be, but it's funny because their position now, I think, is pretty much that you shouldn't need to do it, but it's unnecessary. That's right. Yeah, I'm not. Oh, I still do it every now and then. <laughs> I, and clearly, it's a good thing. I mean, it, it, even if it doesn't help uh, actual battery life, just running it all the way down so that you at least get a accurate measurement uh, is helpful. But uh, but well, what I like is that so if you try it. And then all of a sudden you see that the apparent capacity, the battery in milliamp hours, which several utilities can report has gone up. Yeah. Then you can pat yourself on the back and say, boy, I'm smart. I, I calibrated it and I, I made the battery better. 
Right. That's right. Which is uh, like what I think that happened once. And then I'm like, okay, well, I've convinced myself that this is a good thing to do. (laughs) Right. That's right. Yes, of course. And it it can be like Lisa's phone was it. uh, I think we still need a new battery for it. It's a it's a plus size phone. So it had uh, 2700 milliamp hour, uh, you know, native factory battery life. Uh, when I plugged it into coconut battery, it said that it was 1700 milliamp hour capacity. So Ooh. way down. And I did the whole deal with it. Both things, letting the battery run all the way down and come back up and the, uh, you know, the, the wipe and restore. And that brought it up to, I think like 2200 or something. I mean, it's not great. It's not 27, but you know, way above the 17 that it was reporting. So. It definitely I think helps. the guideline pretty much across devices is this. after a year, you should have about 80% of the maximum capacity available. That's right. Yep. Otherwise, something may be wrong. Yep. And Apple may replace your battery for you. Correct. Correct. They've done That's it for right. me at least once. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the OS, uh, I don't know if it still reports it, but yeah, or it'll say service battery. Mm-hmm. Or some uh, on the MacBook, it'll yes. say service battery. Oh, yeah. The phone... Yeah, the phone won't. Good. But but I think this that same eighty percent is if it's in warranty and your battery has less than eighty percent of its factory capacity left. I think that's that's generally the the rule. But if somebody out there knows better, please let us know. Of course, feedback at macgeekup dot com is is the best place to uh, to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, despite the uh, shenanigans of the cable guy earlier, Dave, I, I think I did hear you right. Uh, in that you said feedback at MacGeekGab.com. I said feedback at MacGeekGab.com, unless you're a premium listener, in which case premium at MacGeekGab.com is the email address that you can use because you're uh, taking the extra step and supporting us directly. In fact, I want to thank this week's premium subscribers, John. Those that had contributed, uh, we had many, many, in fact. Uh, Brian D., did a one-time $40 contribution, and David Y. did a one-time $100 contribution. Thank you to you, too. Uh, on the monthly plan, 10 bucks a month, James B., John G., James C., Joe S., Ari L., Paul M., and JC. And then on the biannual $25 every six-month plan, Robert S., Neil L., Scott G., Brian W., Art K., Chris F., Daniel M and Daniel W uh, doing 50 bucks every six months. Thank you so much to all of you. If you want to learn more about uh, our premium program and all of that good stuff, and you want to support us directly, we certainly would appreciate it. You can visit MacGeekab.com slash premium. Uh, It is not mandatory, of course, but uh, for those of you that can and would like to, we certainly appreciate it. It, but between that and our sponsors, that's what it takes to uh, to put this show together for you every week. So it you you are an integral part of that. And I, thank you. I can't say thank you enough. So I, I don't know what else to say other than thanks. Yeah, good. Thank you for your support. Yeah. Hey, um, y- you know, something I wanted to talk about. We've been talking about High Sierra a lot and uh and it made some changes in terms of compatibility and apps and all that. And so it's forced a lot of us to sort of stop and think and perhaps do those upgrades that we haven't done for many, many OS versions. And uh, in Microsoft Office comes up on that. Uh, the Adobe software comes up because th- th- that was a change from Sierra to High Sierra. Many versions of those things just got got cut out because of the way High Sierra is uh, sort of addressing libraries and that sort of thing right now. Um, FileMaker for me was that one. And we have been running here. we had been running FileMaker 11 uh, for many years, largely because the file format changed from uh, 11 to 12 many moons ago. We are now at FileMaker 16. And we took High Sierra as a reason to really dig in and, and of course, upgrade everything internally here to um, FileMaker 16. We have custom databases that uh, that we wrote 
for our Mac Observer contacts and for Backbeat Media, really our entire uh, CRM system is something we we built from scratch. It does, in, a, in addition to all of our customer tracking, it does all of our invoicing and billing and like everything. The entire business runs on it. And, uh, and so we migrated that stuff up to FileMaker 12, which was amazingly smooth. It, it, was, it, it took almost no time at all. But now that we're on FileMaker 12, there's some really interesting things that uh, that can happen. Uh, sorry, did I say we upgraded to FileMaker 12? We, we could have. FileMaker 12 won't run on High Sierra either. FileMaker 13 and later does. We upgraded all the way to FileMaker 16. FileMaker 12 is the file format that we're on, but the version of FileMaker that we're on is FileMaker 16. And uh, they've done some really cool things with it, John. I, I'm, I've been impressed. Uh, one thing that they they've done is on the server side. So it, 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 they've, they've like the mobile experience with FileMaker is stellar and they've really upgraded things both in the, the, the mobile client on, on iOS, as well as the server software. Now they've got this whole PDF engine built into the servers. So you can, uh, create, PDFs from your mobile apps. You can sign PDFs and create that happening inside of FileMaker. Um, all kinds. Of, I mean, it's it's crazy how well that works now. And it's just smooth. Uh, for those of us that create our own FileMaker databases, they've added two things that really blew me away when you're trying to edit for those of us. And I know we have a bunch of listeners who, who create FileMaker stuff here. Uh, when you're editing inside of the layouts of FileMaker, you, you have a lot of objects like you, you have like, like, like literal objects on the, in the layout, like a label and maybe a field. And then maybe you would have a, a graphical object to have y y your background color and things like that, just to make it look nice. And it used to be really difficult if you needed to kind of dig in and click with the mouse just to find the right spot. They've added two commands, hide objects on top and hide all other objects. And it doesn't hide them from being visible in the layout. It just hides them while you're editing. So you can really get in and see what you want. It's one of those things. But you understand what I'm saying, John, where, you know, you're trying to like edit something and you can't quite click because something else is there, maybe overlapping it and you just, it's frustrating. So now you can tell it, nope, get rid of this other stuff just while I'm editing. I know it sounds silly, but man, it has made a huge difference for us in terms no, of when you're edits. designing. Yeah. You, what you're telling me is that stuff gets in the way. Stuff gets in the way. You'd yeah. Rather not see. So, uh, yeah, no. So that's a, yeah. A nice tweak to, uh, so this is when you're designing the database. When you're field. when you're designing the layouts for the database, that's right. The, yeah. Sort of the visual aspect of it, and there the the web engine works really well now with uh, with FileMaker Server 16. It takes your layouts that you built for the desktop client and like uh, they've it's always sort of done this, but now it really makes them work well on the web. Like no difference whatsoever in most cases that we've tried, which is great. Because then it, you know, you can scale way faster. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the whole promise of web services. Correct. Yeah. 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 And it, I'll tell you, you know, we, I used FileMaker Go 16 on my iPhone the last time we were at Pepcom, John. And, uh, and I tell you this now, I wouldn't tell the person this that I, that I walked up to, but I'm walking up to the booth and I couldn't remember the name of the person that I normally deal with. I know, I knew they weren't there. But as I was going up to the booth, I wanted to say, hey, I'm Dave from Mac Cab, and uh, I normally talk to, you know, so and so. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. But I couldn't remember so and so's name. And so in like the 10 seconds that I was walking up to the booth, I pulled my phone out of my pocket, launched FileMaker Go. It authenticates with at that point it was Touch ID because I didn't have uh, an iPhone 10 to do Face ID, but it authenticates with Touch ID. I typed into the search field, the name of the company, whatever it was, saw it come up, saw the person's name, put my phone in my pocket as I was saying, hey, I'm Dave. I normally talk with Tim, but, uh, you know, it's a pleasure to meet you. And it was perfectly smooth, really easy over even just over a data 
connection. Uh, really impressive yeah. that the, a lot of the stuff they've done here and they've got, if you want to, if you don't want to have to worry about hosting your own thing, they've got FileMaker cloud. Now and we'll put a link in the show notes to, to that. That's their own service. They partnered with Amazon web services to do it. And, uh, and then they've also got custom app Academy where they'll teach you how to do these things. I'll tell you, uh, you do not have to be a programmer to, to create, a, like a, a usable functional database custom inside FileMaker. Most of the backbeat media database, I coded up some of the crazy stuff that we do, but um, and it's not really coding. It's more just saying, you know, do this with that um, and a lot of clicking. But uh, Greg Snyder, who was, you know, one of my yeah. co-founders at, at backbeat media, he laid out our database. He's not a programmer by any stretch. And he was just like, yeah, I want this field here and this field here and that there. And it can just, you, boom. can you do SQL if you wanted to, or that's just, um, just what they you, do? Uh, you know, I, it, 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 no, I think maybe there's a way to do SQL like stuff, you know, like queries, but you, you can know, do you queries. Wanted. Yes. You, you can do queries in FileMaker's own way. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And so like, uh, so they have their own language, you know, some, you know, select whatever from whatever, where whatever equals whatever, and, you know, links to tables and then you get. Yes, but you don't have to say select. You just kind of what you, what you do is you create a series of linked find requests. So yes, mm -hmm. it's that, but it, but you don't have to understand like the semantics of SQL to do that. Yeah, That's yeah. sort of the beauty of it. Is so they any, have their own textual yeah. Language, but you're you can, not you're not writing it out. You're you you can mm -hmm. do it graphically. You can say, okay, okay. I want to find this and this, and then open a new find window, and you know, omit that from this, and and it it becomes this very visual thing. So you don't you don't actually think about the fact that you're doing this and creating this very complex uh, find statement. And the cool part is, after you do it and you do it all visually, you can say, all right, save this find. You're good to go. I I'm. I'm uh, you know, we keep looking at different CRMs and stuff, and uh, FileMaker is the one that that comes around for us every time because it's so flexible. Anybody here can, you know, edit stuff and and put things in and really manipulate it the way we want. And Dave, guess what? What's the that? answer is yes. How do I know this? Because Brian Monroe in our chat room, which yes. you can find at MacGeekab dot com slash stream, found something at FileMaker saying, "Oh, oh yeah, you want to do a SQL query? Here you go." For all oh, you SQL that? geeks. Yeah. I knew yeah. I I had I knew I had heard something about it, but um Yeah. SQL is a standard that everybody well, SQL's a standard for dealing with databases and right. people like it because it's standard. Because it's standard, yeah, absolutely. But yeah. no, I I much prefer um you know, I mean back in the my Microsoft development days, visual tools rock because Yeah. And FileMaker's always been this way. I mean, for you know, whatever, twenty years or thirty years. It's crazy. They really, they, it, it's a great piece of software. I, I can't recommend it enough. It, it's I, been around forever. They've been around forever. Yeah. They're, an, they're a wholly owned subsidiary of Apple now, but that's not how they started life. Uh, but that, that's how they are now. But they, they run their own thing. I, anyway, I, I just wanted to take a minute and kind of talk about FileMaker because it's, it's something very important to me. And I know I, we get a lot of email from folks about FileMaker. So I figured it's time to maybe, you know, roll this into the show and, and uh, see where it goes. So, yeah. Cool. All right, John, you want to take us to Edward? Edward's got a good one. Uh, I'm not going to laugh. No. <laughs> Edward says, my wife dropped her iPhone 6 in the toilet about six months ago and borrowed another iPhone 6 from a coworker. She's now getting her iPhone 10 and wants to return the iPhone 6 back to her coworker. However, she has some correspondence in the messages that she does not want anyone to see. And I'm not sure if he means the messages app. Probably messages app, messages. or it could be mail. Okay. Yeah, but, but you're or it could right. be it could email. Be either. Okay. Yeah. Yep. All right. But I think uh, what I'm going to say applies to both cases. Um, she's very paranoid about someone being able to get into it, even if I do a clean install on the phone. Is there a way to do something similar to a secure erase on the Mac for the iPhone? I do have a copy of iMazing if that helps. Oh, it helps helps them. <laughs> you guys are amazing. Thanks for your help. No, Ed, you're amazing. Um, 
So my reply is as follows, Days. So for a device that uses RAM rather than a rotational hard drive, uh, the concept of a secure race, and, and my interpretation of secure race, um, at least as far as disutility is concerned, if you try to run disutility, is when you erase a rotational drive, um, there are a number of increasingly complex steps that you can take. So one is, well, just wipe out the directory, you know, of all the stuff on here and, uh, and ship it. The thing is, all the data is left over, and if somebody knows what they're doing, they could retrieve it. So uh, another option is I think it'll write over every piece of the drive with ones or zeros, or it gets more complex, you know, the different patterns and things like that. That's a secure erase. For rotational hard drive, Dave, uh, magnetic hard drive, that makes sense. But for RAM devices, it, it, because of the way they arrange data, and let, let me see if you're with me on this here, at least SSDs, and I would assume the iPhone as well, the way the data is laid out, the erase in the device itself, I think, is going to do it for you. That is, well, it, it, I, it either is going to do it for you or isn't, but you could, you could attempt to do something along the lines of a secure erase to an SSD. It wouldn't actually do what you want. It, it's not going to go and write cells to, there's no way to address individual cells, memory cells inside an SSD, the way that you can address individual sectors on a rotational drive. So you could say, go write, if you've got, let's say you've got a, a hundred gig drive, just for the sake of argument, you could say with a rotational drive, you could say, write a, a hundred gig file of all zeros. And when you do that, it's going to fill up the drive, right? Uh, if you do that on an SSD, it, things start getting a little weird and you won't necessarily overwrite everything the way the drive is. So there is no way to secure a race in SSD. And, and, uh, well, and, I'll, uh, some SSDs at one point would actually have a special command saying, Hey, can you do with something called a secure race? It, it was totally outside of the OS, hmm. but I've seen mention of some that will do that, but it, but it has to be it, it's specific to, to very few SSDs. That yeah. Have, and it would, it's bad for an SSD to, to, you know, just write nothing right. because you get a limited number of write cycles per, for every yeah. memory cell. Well, I think a lot of utilities, if you try to do a secure erase, it's like, uh, this is an SSD you really don't. Yeah. Want it does. That. It's not going to do anything. Yeah. Um, so no, but in like, the case of an iOS device, Dave, there is no, no option to do a secure erase. No. And you could wipe your phone and restore it. And give it to this other person. And if they really dug and really knew what they were doing, they might, might stumble across some of your old data. Now, two things. Number one, all your data is encrypted anyway. So if you wipe it, the encryption or the decryption key for the old data isn't out there. So I don't think you're going to get anything off of it. And number right. two... There's really no other way other than to like take a hammer to that phone and just smash it. So it's yeah. yeah. You don't have to do that. So no. um. So there, there are two articles that I'll uh, refer you to. Um. One is is an article from Apple. I'm not actually entirely thrilled by it. Well, I don't think it tells you everything, Dave. But it's an article that we'll link to called "What to Do Before You Sell or Give Away Your iPhone, iPad, or iPod Touch." And it goes on, use these steps to remove your personal information from a device, even if you don't have it anymore. Um, the thing that you want to keep in mind with an iOS device, Dave, is that, so once you tell it, and at some point you'll get a step saying, erase all the data on this device. And once you do that, the data's gone, right? Correct. There's no way for, for a normal individual to get it back it to, because it erases it or it's, you know, removes the directory entries, but, but there's... No tool that I'm aware of for your average person to pick up the phone then and say, oh, I just restored all your data. So, well, right. Right. The, and the just thing, to be clear, it, because there's been some discussion in the chat room here with Brian Monroe. Um, yes, your your data will likely still remain on the device, but it was encrypted when it was put there and the key is not there. I know I said that before, but I just wanted yes. to say it again, just That's just to make it clear. So somebody could get it, but if they don't have the key, because they don't, mm -hmm. and you don't either, because you've wiped the device clean, you're not going to get the data. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I verified this. The last time I, you know, traded in my phone is, you know, I went through the steps they, they told me and I erased everything. And then, you know, I pretended that it was a new phone and I 
started going through it. And it's like, yeah, I mean, the phone is like, yeah, who am I? I, I don't know who I am. Right. You know, I'm, I'm a clean slate. But here's the things to keep in mind with an Apple device. And you and I actually went through this uh, in, in some fashion, Dave, a while ago. You want to make sure that you disconnect it from the Apple ecosphere. Um, so I wouldn't worry about the data. I would worry that you have not unassociated it with various Apple services. And they tell you how to do a lot of this, like unpair with your Apple Watch. Um, log out of iCloud. Log out of iTunes in the App Store. Um, now, the Apple article doesn't mention this, Dave, but uh, iMazing has an article also called Safely Wipe Your iPhone or iPad Before Trading in and Reselling It. And they have an, int uh, an interesting addition that I think it's worth pointing to their article because they specifically say, and log out of find my iPhone. Hmm. Cause you and I ran into this, Dave, when I sold you one of my old machines, I had not gone through all the proper steps to disassociate my Mac from the, uh, Apple ecosphere. And all of a sudden one day I'm running, uh, you know, find my uh, iCloud and find my iPhone. And it said, uh, Lucas's MacBook pro. And I'm like, Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Right. <laughs> because right. it was the machine that I sold you. Right. And I guess I didn't either log it out of find my Mac or I didn't kick it out of my uh, iCloud database. So it still appeared. Now what they say, the, the way to solve that problem. So I couldn't, you know, be evil and remotely access this stuff is, is, you know, change your uh, iCloud password maybe when you're uh, switching things in and out. So even though I could see his machine, uh, assuming he, selected a password that wasn't the same as mine, I wouldn't be able to do anything. You couldn't. Yeah. Right. Right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So I would not worry about it. There, there are between these two resources, uh, follow the steps and, uh, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. It, 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 once you erase all settings and data, uh, no one's going to get anything off that phone. Um, and even before that, they might not get anything unless, they have the password, but, uh, but yeah, settings, general, uh, reset, erase all content and settings. And the nice part is at least with iOS 11, when you do that now, John, mm -hmm. the, um, it, it, it'll tell you to sign out of find my iPhone when you do that. Oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah. It'll also ask you if you want to make a, you know, last kind of final backup too, which is handy. So, Yeah. There yes. Yes. Cool. Um, all right, Larry, while we're in sort of file system geekiness here, we will, uh, we will go to Larry because there's some things that have changed with APFS. Larry says, uh, you guys are mentioning snapshots and that's the first time I'd heard about them. He says, I'm trying to partition my drive. Uh, oh, it's uh, never mind. He, he had a separate issue, but, uh, he was talking about repartitioning drives and uh, with APFS, and he said it was getting hung up checking, you know, snapshot X out of 13, where X is the number of the snapshot. He said so that it's making so he says so that is making it take a lot longer than I have time for. Uh, so snapshots and really repartitioning with APFS is. It, 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 everything's changes now because with APFS, you don't carve out specific space on the drive. You just carve out one blob of space for APFS and it's shared amongst all your volumes. Uh, so there's no fixed sizes on partitions and it's just an important thing to remember. And I know we've talked about it on the show here before, but, uh, but if you go into disk utility, and you go to repartition something, really all you're doing is saying, take this blob of storage here and add another volume to it. And you can say, I want this volume to have, you know, a minimum reserve size of X or a maximum reserve size of X, but it doesn't force you to actually carve out physical space anymore, which is handy because... You can have things kind of, you know, m malleable and move space around. Have you done any repartitioning, John, with uh, with High Sierra? Mm -hmm. Nothing outside of it converting my volume. Sure. Yeah, of course. Of course. <clears throat> yeah. 
Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. And it, it, I know this is going to keep coming up. And so I just kind of wanted to reinforce that message. So when Larry's question came in, it was like, yeah, let's, let's just say it again. So you've yeah. got, I'm, I'm trying to think of the, like the right analogy to use. Um, I, you know, think about it like this. This is going to be crazy. It's not, the, it's not going to be my final analogy on this, but it's going to be my first one. Uh, think about that. You have a bag. Okay. And it's a water tight bag, right? So you could fill that bag up with water. Uh, if you take, and, and that would be your one volume, right? And so if you, if you fill it half full of water, well, your volume's half full. If you go all the way up, um, it's all the way full. And we don't go half empty because, you know, we're optimistic dudes here. Uh, if you put another bag inside that, that bag's not going to really take up any room until you start putting water in it, right? It's just sharing the space of the first bag that it's inside. That's what's happening with your storage with APFS and partitions mm -hmm. is you can put lots of little bags inside the one big bag and they can all be the same. They can all grow to the full size of the bag. It just depends on how much water is in each one. The big bag's still only going to hold whatever the maximum amount of water that it could hold is. But you could partition it out into little ones and they don't talk to each other because they're all watertight. Does that make sense? I know it's crazy, but, you know, I like my extended no. analogy. I just came back from Texas. I, That's uh, the land of the extended analogy. So, well, I, um, well, I was doing what you were talking about today and that I, I double bagged my groceries. See, there you go. I put one bag inside the other and it took up nearly the same amount of space. Correct. Not quite because it's inside of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the second bag was kind of like a partition. Yeah. And you could have put a you could have put a third bag, like two inside one. But at big some one. point, at least with bags, the, the physics is just. Uh, how many times can you fold a piece of paper? Uh, as many as you like. No, I think it's eight. What? Folding folding it and then folding it again. I think the the limit is eight. It's physics. I don't know. Depends on how big the piece of paper is. No. No. Oh, there's, there's oh, there is a there, limit. It doesn't matter oh, how big the piece of paper is. I see what you're saying. I think the limit. Yeah. With today's paper is eight folds. Maybe it's less. I, I don't like it depends on how thick the paper is. Yeah. No, it doesn't. Oh, it doesn't no. really. No, it doesn't. No, I don't think it does. Oh. Huh. Yeah, it's a it's a head scratcher. But anyway, huh. speaking of head scratchers, I think Alan has something. Oh, uh, we're gonna take a minute though, John. I, I mean, this is good. Don't get me wrong. I like where <laughs> we're going here. <laughs> But, uh, but I do want to, uh, uh, you know, I want to talk about our, our sponsors. If oh, that's, uh, sure. if that's okay. Yeah. All right. Our first sponsor today is Harry's where at harrys.com slash MGG, you can get a free trial set from Harry's. This is a $13 value. You get it for free. You just have to pay the shipping, which is just a few bucks and you'll get a weighted razor handle. These things feel great in your hand. A blade set that is five blades. It's like a cartridge that fits right on the handle. It's got five blades in it. It's got a little lubricating strip to keep it moving nice. And on the other side, you turn it around. It's got a trimmer blade. It's also got like this flex to it. They've sort of engineered and evolved over the course of doing this. Really, really good stuff. I mean, they just keep getting better and better. And I I liked it to begin with. It's it's really great. And then it co also comes with in this free trial set, you get their like foamy, lathering, rich shave gel, and you get a cover uh, for the uh, for the blades. So you can bring it with you when you travel, like I did uh, this past weekend when I was in Austin. You know, I know this is no shave November. I used to like you know carve in a beard or whatever. Or just, you know, kind of let it go because it doesn't matter. I don't have to go anywhere and see people generally. Uh, you folks don't know what I look like when I do this show, so I could be a hairy mess. But I'm not because I really like the way Harry's makes me feel like it. It feels good while I'm shaving and it feels good after I shave. I mean, it's so smooth so perfect i really it, it it has changed me i used to be an electric razor guy for decades i was an electric razor guy started trying this harry stuff i i don't even i think the battery in my electric razor is dead now 
I mean, because I, I haven't charged it, in, you know, years. So you got to check this out. Go to harrys.com slash MGG. That's where you're going to get the free trial offer, $13 value. If you're doing some holiday shopping, you can get it done early because they just released their special edition holiday sets that make great gifts. They get a button for gifts on their site. Go check that out. Really cool stuff. But for you, get your free trial. Go to harrys.com slash MGG right now. Sign up for it. You're good to go. Our thanks to Harry's for sponsoring this episode. Our second sponsor for today is Barebones Software at barebones.com with the new BB Edit 12. Well, man, you know that BB Edit's an app that I keep open all the time. Well, 12 takes it to a whole other level, which is pretty amazing considering the fact that they've been around, I think, more than twice as long as Mac Geek Gab has. That's pretty crazy. They've got this dark theme support when you're using a dark color scheme bb edit now colors your editing and project window uh to match it looks really good and uh you know they've always had this ftp slash sftp browser so you can open up things from remote servers and edit them like they're local and when you hit you know command s to save it saves it across the ftp or the sftp link They've improved the UI for that. It's, it's way smoother, way better. Uh, they've now got an outline view there for improved navigation. You can preview things right inside BB Edit windows if you're editing HTML. They've got a new text extraction feature uh, that extends the searching capabilities and allows you to locate and collect search results into a single document. It's amazing that they can find ways to continue to improve this and then show them to us. It's like, whoa, I didn't know I needed that, except I need it. Right. It's a very Apple way of doing things for a text editor. You got to check it out. Go to barebones.com. Our thanks to Barebones Software and all the great people there for sponsoring this episode. Our next sponsor for today is stamps.com, where you can go to stamps.com. You go there, you click on the little microphone in the upper right hand corner. Of the page, I think it's in the upper right hand corner, and you're gonna enter in MGG. And what that gets you is a four week free trial of stamps.com. It comes with supplies, postage, and a digital scale. This is the time of year when we're all shipping stuff like crazy business, personal, all of it. You get discounts. This is the time of year to check out stamps.com. And I've been totally impressed with it, really blown away. Uh, I had heard about it, of course, before they came on board as a sponsor, but I'd never really checked them out. Man, you can ship anything. If you can do it at the post office, you can do it here. The nice part is you don't have to wait in line, right? You can, if you like to wait in line, you can go to the post office and wait in line, but you could bring your stamps.com printed postage. You get the discount. Uh, and if you don't want to wait in line, you just, you know, drop it off there. Our post office, probably like yours, has a place where once everything's prepaid, you can just drop it off or you can have them come pick it up for free. You can do it all from your desk any time of day, literally any kind of postage or whatever you can print at the post office or you can get at the post office. You can print at home, including just regular, you know, stamps for your letters. Actually, you just print the letter. It has the address and the postage right there on it. So you got to do this. Uh, Check it out. This is the right time of year. Just visit stamps.com, click on the microphone, enter the code MGG, and that gets you the four week trial. It includes postage and a digital scale before you do anything else. Just go do that. It's really, really great. Uh, we've been using it here, not just to send letters, but also to put postage on packages, all sorts of stuff, certified mail, whatever you want. It really, really works. Check it out. Stamps.com. Click on the microphone, type in MGG, and you're going to be blown away, just like I have been. Our thanks to Stamps.com for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, you want to take us to Alan? Alan's got a disc-based mystery, <clears throat> but we're going to solve it and learn something, maybe. All right. I use the utility program Mountain to manage my external disk drives attached to my laptop. It enables me to dismount all external disks with a single click when I want to go mobile. Cool. 
Since upgrading the High Sierra, Mountain has been notifying me of the mounting and unmounting of discs I've never seen before and do not understand. Preboot, recovery, VM, Watson at snap-704845, and so on. Watson, by the way, is the name of my internal SSD. Hmm, what are these discs, and why is the system mounting and dismounting them? I'm going to tell you exactly what they are. Well, first, I wasn't quite sure. Um, so you're going to have to uh, maybe go to the terminal uh, or disutility, but I prefer terminals for this. But uh, my reflection, Dave, is that this is, does something very similar to something that I use called Hardware Growler, and that's kind of how I knew what some of this was. Um, and that it's also a tool that tells you about disk mounting and unmounting events uh, via the OS, or sometimes installers get sneaky, Dave. I still see some things do this. Um, and OS things, like every now and then I'll see it and it says, yeah, I'm just mounting recovery just, just because. And it's like, okay, that's cool. And then it's like, yeah, I unmounted it. Or yeah, I'm mounting EFI. I'm like, okay, which is uh, the firmware. Because huh. um, sometimes it updates it. So, so it's kind of neat to see uh, you know, what's happening behind the scenes, the, the OS uh, is looking out for you. Sure. Um, or updating itself, uh, or self-healing, if you will. Uh, but if you go to the terminal and you type disutil list, well, disutil, of course, is uh, disutility, and then list, it's going to list every disk and partition thereof, Dave. And now, these things kind of make sense here. So pre-boot, I think that's something new in High Sierra, Dave, or APFS. Um, recovery, okay, well, you know, I just talked about that, right? Well, recovery is your recovery partition, which you uh, normally get into and has all sorts of handy utilities by holding down Command-R. VM, Dave, I'm going to bet dollars to donuts. Mm, donuts. Um, is virtual memory. I don't know why it's exposed here. What do you think? A virtual um, machine? I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I mean. Well, let me see how big it is. Hold on. I, let, me, let me see I don't, how big it says it is. Yeah. Huh. Uh, let's see. All right. Um, it is right now showing VM. All right. So on, on my Mac Mini, it's showing VM as 1.1 gigabytes. That kind of sounds like. Virtual memory. Oh. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, so it used to be right. It used to be that it in Sierra and prior, virtual memory was created by way of of creating actual files. Like it would, it, the OS would would start using files and 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 say, okay, I need a gig more of virtual memory. So let's mm -hmm. write a file that's a gig and then we can use that one. And if we need more, we'll create another one. If we need less, we'll start deleting them. Uh, with APFS, based on our, our bags and water scheme, it's way better to treat it like Unix likes to treat virtual memory, which is its own partition. But... Because we can use another bag, it just throws another bag in and says, put the virtual memory here. Keep it compartmentalized. And that's it looks like it's exactly what it's doing. Because I've got the podcast machine here is uh, a Sierra machine. So it it still does it the old way. So when you just were talking about this, I'm like, oh, dude, I'm not seeing it. And then, of course, it was like, oh, yeah, ding, ding, ding. Got to look at a high Sierra machine. So I right. SSH'd into my iMac downstairs and I'm seeing the same thing. I've got 5.4 gigs of uh, virtual memory uh, or VM, which I assume is virtual memory on my AP. Well, it definitely is because so yeah. I'm looking with iStat menus and it shows my swap memory yep. is, well, it's using 520 out of one gig, 520 megabytes out of one gigabyte, oh, but it is right. one gigabyte. Yeah, so, there you go. Okay. So that's absolutely what, what that yeah. VM is. That makes so, sense. Um, and that'll shrink and grow as it needs to. And it can do it inside the container now. Makes all the sense in the world. Yeah. It's actually this machine. Okay. This machine has eight gigs. So, so I can understand it having a one gig uh, swap partition. With oh, dude. Gigs. My computer downstairs has 32 gigs of RAM and it's, <laughs> it's using 5.4 gigs of swap. It, there's still issues with the way Mac OS manages RAM, uh, but we won't get well, into that. Well, I think that. Unix in general always likes to have VM just, just. Yeah. Oh, no. It needs just to have some it level of it. Correct. Yeah. Like, remember, not. I think there were some crazy people in the past that said, you know, can I disable virtual memory and just run everything in RAM? And it's like, ah, Unix doesn't like it when you do that. That's been my experience, because I think when I tried that, it, was, it, was, it wasn't pretty. No. But <laughs> the it, OS it, reacts un <laughs> yeah, unpleasantly. The OS gets yeah. angry. <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah. 
All right. So I think that's the answer. So uh, a handy little thing to see. And it also shows other attached volumes. So it's also showing my uh, external backup. And it's like, oh, yeah. And there's, you know, EFI and boot OS 10 and Mac sure. backup. So it yeah. shows my backup drive as well. So um, just so everybody knows, though, that, you know, because we had another question about somebody who's saying, oh, I see this preboot volume. What is that? Um, oh. It just so kind of to, to because we like to know what normal looks like, uh, I'm going to assume my machine is normal because it's it's not you know failing on me at the moment. Um, my APFS volume, my boot volume has four partitions on it. It it the top one at five, if you count APFS container scheme, but that's not a partition. That's just sort of the thing. And then it's right. got four vol four volumes. Let's not call them partitions because they're not partitions. They're volumes. Um, and there's four APFS volumes. One is the actual, you know, the drive that I think of it as, uh, which for me is half Nelson. Cause of course that's the name of the Miles Davis song. No, it, that, I name all my, my hard drives after that. All right. And then there's three others that are, that are hidden from me, except in this disc util list. And they are probably the same as what you have, John preboot, Mm -hmm. recovery mm -hmm. and VM. Yes, sir. And so that's okay. The fact that you're seeing that too. Now we know four APFS volumes on your boot drive is normal. Um, and, and specifically preboot recovery and VM are there. It's totally okay. Don't freak out if you see preboot and, and you're good to go. So, yeah. All right. That's well, good. in this case, you shouldn't freak out if you see preboot. Dave, Correct. But yeah, if it starts appearing on your drive, like if it starts appearing on your desktop, that's not necessarily a good thing. So, and I want to mention that because I did have that happen, and I think it was a lack of proper cleanup code in a High Sierra installer because I had a a folder on my root drive, Dave, called Preboot, and it's mm -hmm. like uh, that shouldn't be there, or I shouldn't be able to see this. Right. Right. <laughs> So I threw it away. And uh, now some may say, that's crazy, John. What are you doing? But I'm like, you don't belong there. No, I'm sure it was left over because normally the installer will copy a lot of things to the local hard drive and then reboot and then do something clever. But sometimes it doesn't clean up its mess. Right. And, and I think that's what right. some of us have seen. Yep. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Oh, and then snapshot. So snap. the so last thing, of course, snapshot is a new feature in APFS. Uh, so, so when he saw a volume at snap, I don't think it was saying, Oh snap. I think it was saying, <laughs> Oh, I'm, you know, here's a couple of snapshot, uh, partitions, I guess, or volumes. Uh, they're just I'm trying snapshots. to think what to call them. The thing is I've run disutility under high Sierra. And if you do first aid at some point, it'll say, yeah, I'm, I'm just checking out these snapshot things just to make sure that they're consistent or they, they look reasonable. And uh, that's the only time I've ever had a snapshot made visible to me, Dave, is through uh, disutility first aid. I don't know about you. Yeah, no, that they uh, I'm looking to see if there's there's no real way to manage these snapshots that I've found. Um, but hopefully somebody, maybe Apple, will write a utility where we can actually start, you know, managing them from a like a backup or and, a, to, you know that and i'm almost certain at one point maybe it was creating one or doing something or changing the state of one but i'm almost certain at some point dave also at the root of my hard drive and you may be asking yourself why you keep looking at the root of your hard drive and it's like because i can because we're geeks um, yeah but i saw a folder called like com.apple. something dot snapshot but it mm. had the circle with the line through it which means uh-uh, you can't get in here. And sure enough, you know, I double clicked on it. And it's like, you don't have permissions to get into that. And it's like, what are you talking about? It's my computer, man. So I don't, I don't know why that happened. I think that may have been a, a permissions or visibility or, or something bug. But I saw at one point something, a folder that looked like it contained the snapshots. And it was so, made somewhat visible to me. Yeah, so Alex is saying, uh, he posted a video on Facebook. And, and to be fair, I haven't caught up on everything on Facebook since my uh, travels here, but, um, but he's saying uh, in, in the video, the guy installed a bunch of stuff and then ran uh, booted to the recovery recovery partition and did like a time machine t style restore to choose the snapshot to bring up. And it went, it rolled everything all the way back. 
came back up almost instantly, but was, you know, where things uh, had been prior so that that's how these snapshots can be used. Um, and Alex is saying he could choose from more than one snapshot. So we got to go watch that video that we'll put a link to that in the show notes for sure. That's great. Thanks, Alex. But at this point, snapshots are kind of an internal mystery feature in that I, I, I don't. Yeah, I have no, I don't know how to say like, take a snapshot right now. Um, but yeah. Oh, wait, no, no. There, hold on. Can you? I mean, it may sound like we're babbling incoherently here, but, but actually this is part of our strategy, folks. Right? Yes. But I'm, but I'm, I'm curious where we're going. Yeah. Well, no, I think we had someone mention to us that this utility has additional goodies. He's saying from the snapshot. terminal, yes. But I thought there were additional. I don't know. Commands. In di- so we'll, di- we'll dig into it. We'll find it. Yeah. Uh, it still talks about uh, journals. When I'm looking at the... Uh, yeah, I don't see anything. I just I just type disk util space APFS on the um, on the command line, and and I'm not seeing anything about snapshots there either. So we'll we'll dig into it. We'll follow up on another show. That's that's good. Keeps this keeps things interesting. We do have a bunch of cool stuff found to go through though. So uh, let's see. Let's see if we can get through this. I think we can. Uh, starting with listener Mark, who. Says he's got two things for us. Cool stuff found. Number one, beyond compare. He says, I found this gem a few years back when I needed to migrate files from one server to a replacement. And I wanted to check the outcome to make sure everything made the move. Uh, Beyond compare compares and syncs folders. It compares and merges text files. It works across local disks, servers, FTP servers, inside of zip files, inside of subversion repositories, etc. It says licenses are available for single or multiple users. Their trial period, uh, at least some time ago, he says before he purchased the license, was for 30 days of use, not 30 calendar days, which allowed for a thorough shakedown. So very cool. We will uh, we will put a link to Beyond Compare there in the uh, in the show notes. That's I'd never heard of that one. That's pretty cool, man. So thanks for sharing that. And then, uh, and then cool stuff found number two is volume control. He says, uh, again, it's still listener Mark, hence number two. Uh, I recently bought a raspberry Pi three and configured it as an airplay receiver. He says a topic for another time. Changing the airplay volume was frustrating. He says, as I needed to get focused to iTunes rather than, then just use the volume controls on my IMAX keyboard. Enter volume control. An installer is available and you can use the command key as a modifier to change the volume in iTunes while not affecting your computer's speaker volume. So we'll put a link to that in the show notes too. Very, very cool. I like it. It's good. Good, good, good. Yeah, moving along, John. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, and then we move on to Steven. We talked about VPNs recently. We actually have two cool stuffs found. Uh, Steven brings us to, uh, he says air VPN. He said, uh, I'm trying to think of where we get here, but the, but the, but the, oh yeah. He says, I choose to use air VPN. What I like about it is that I can choose which port and protocol to use. Commonly public Wi-Fi hotspots will block VPNs. He says, but I can generate a config, for example, using TCP port 443, which, of course, for those of you who don't know, is the port that all of your web uh, encrypted web traffic, all the HTTPS traffic goes over. So if you've got your VPN running on that port, chances are people aren't going to block that because they're going to want to let you browse secure websites. Uh, he says, I have a config for the very exceptional lockdown Wi-Fi hotspots, even on TCP port 80, which is where non-encrypted web traffic goes. He says, uh, these configs are easy to set up and they work over OpenVPN and are designed for massive range of OSs. So airvpn.org is his VPN of choice. So that's pretty cool. I, I like the idea of running a VPN on, um, on port 443. A non-standard port or standard port. Yeah. Just non-standard for a VPN. 
but um, but and and just to be clear, even though he's talking about running these things on the the HTTPS, which is encrypted web port, and and HTTP, which is the non encrypted web port, all the VPN traffic is encrypted. He's just using these ports because uh, the hope is that these you know even people that are blocking VPNs aren't aren't blocking web surfing. So yeah, yeah, they'll cool. figure if the admin's any good, they'll figure it out. But well, they could do deep packet or inspection. The yeah, exactly. If, yeah. if they, they're looking at the contents and they're like, oh, that's, yeah, that's an open. That VPN. doesn't look like traffic that should be in this port. So, uh, right. Right. <laughs> uh, Walter also is here and uh, was talking about VPNs. He said, uh, I wanted to add Mulvad, M-U-L-L-V-A-D dot net to the mix of VPNs you mentioned. It is not based in the U.S. and it is very privacy oriented. They're based in Sweden, but they have servers all over the world that you can connect with. For some reason, he says, I like to have a non-U.S. option. Tinfoil hat time for total anonymity. He says you can even pay by cash in the mail in any currency, which is awesome for getting rid of those extra euros, pounds or Australian dollars you may have picked up on vacations. He says it's a little wacky to mail cash to Sweden with nothing but an account number seems dicey, perhaps, which is maybe he says why I like it. It's kind of a dirty thrill and works like a charm. They have their own app for Mac and Windows and Ubuntu Linux he says uh, I think they just rolled one for Fedora Linux, too. You can connect with you can also connect with an open VPN client. So very, very cool. I like this stuff. It's crazy. Uh, mailing cash to Sweden, John, for your VPN. I feel like maybe they should use uh, Bitcoin too, although maybe they do. Or PayPal? Come on, man. Oh, PayPal's trackable, dude. Yeah. Uh, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess that is the uh, one nice thing about cash. Correct. Oh, as they far do. As they, we know, they it's accept not... Bitcoin. They accept Bitcoin. So you can do it that way too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. As far as we know, cash is not trackable. Well, unless you consider the magnetic inks inside that uh, RF receivers can pick up all your right out and about. But I don't know nothing about that, and I certainly wouldn't suggest that that's even being done. That's correct. That's right. <laughs> um. All right. Oh, uh, now I lost where we were. I had a roll going, but then I got into it. Um. Yeah. You know, I am. Uh, I have been a fan of the new breed of escort radar detectors. Uh, and we've talked about it on the show a couple of times before I wanted to throw a new one out. The The ones I've talked about in the past are they're not inexpensive at all models in the, you know, five to $700 range. And the reason I like those, uh, what I really like the, the feature I like the most out of these things is that, they know my speed and they know the speed limit on the road and they can start alerting me when uh, I'm going X miles per hour over the speed limit. Waze actually can do this too, uh, but it's nice having this device that's also scanning for all of, uh, you know, any, any radar or laser or anything like that. Uh, the Max series uh, escort, the Passport Max series uh, radar detectors that I've tested before have their own GPS built in. They have a database in them of, of all kinds of little things that you can update. And, uh, and they sync with your phone just to get speed limit data because your phone can look that up over a data connection using the escort live app. Well, the new X 80, the escort X 80 changes this a little bit. Instead of it being a six or $700 detector, it's a $300 detector because it doesn't have GPS in it. It doesn't have any of the extra smarts that it doesn't need that are already in your smartphone. So you run the Escort Live app on your iPhone. It auto Bluetooth pairs with this thing. And then it's your iPhone that's doing the GPS to do the speed. See this, John? It's pretty cool. Yeah. I, I like it. I was going to say, um, I mean, the speed feature you can get with ways and I right. constantly, I don't even know why I have it on because it's, it's almost always red when I'm on the highway. Yeah. But you can set weird. it to only alert you when you're like 10 miles an hour over the limit or, you know, whatever you're, if you know, your local, like here in New Hampshire, I know that judges won't take anybody that was going less than 10 miles an hour over the limit. So it's like, perfect. I'll set it to 10, then 10, it alerts me and you're good. Yeah. I think 10 is outside of, 
the margin of error that I think most would consider reasonable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, if, the, if if you were clocked at going one mile over the speed limit, I think most would be just like, dude. Yeah, dude. Yeah, they're not going to pull you over for that. Yeah. Not here in New Hampshire anyway. I, I can't talk about your state. And you also have to look at the local laws. Um, I think we have at least one state. I think Virginia does still doesn't allow radar detectors used in the U.S. And then, of course, uh, other countries are different. It was um, Dom in the chat room reminded me uh, pre-show that Canada uh, basically doesn't allow them anywhere. So, but this is a cool thing. I, like I said, yeah. I, I like the fact that it, it uses the functionality of your iPhone to do, mm-hmm. you know, the, the things that your iPhone can do so that you're not paying twice. And that's a, that's a good thing. I, 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 what I really like is that, you know, I think cars should do this more and more. We wound up, uh, which is a funny story, but I'll tell it another time. We wound up renting a Chevy Malibu for the second half of our trip Ooh. in Austin. Yep. Um, but uh, it had, it, it, we could use the, my Chevrolet app to display stuff on the screen, but it didn't have its own GPS built in. It didn't have all that. And I was like, well, that's really smart because why pay twice? So anyway, that's what I like about this X80 is, uh, is you're not doing the pay twice thing. So I wanted to, I wanted to share that. Uh, let's see. Moving along to James, John, unless there's more on that one. Are we good on that one? We're good. We're good. Okay. Uh, James says you guys were talking about YouTube downloaders. He says the one I use is clip grab at clipgrab.org. It is a Mac app that is a very fast downloader and converter to use it. Simply copy the YouTube link and automatically, uh, and it is automatically added to the app for download. So, We'll put a link to that in the show notes. I like this stuff. It's fun, John. I, um, I, I, I like when I can pull stuff off of YouTube for off time, offline viewing. It, uh, it makes life easier. I, I watched something on the plane. What did I watch? Oh, somebody had put up the Getty Lee uh, interview that uh, Getty Lee, the singer and bass player from Rush, did with Dan. Dan, rather, I watched it on the airplane because I was because I was able to pull it offline. These things are good. Moving on to Allison uh, from of oh, course, that Allison. That it is that Allison from podfeet.com. Uh, she said, uh, I learned something. Well, four things during last week's show. When you talked about stay to help the doctor get his windows to stick when he was unplugging a monitor and logging out and in, she says for this type of thing, I use Moom M O O M from many tricks to create scenes that I want to have static. She said, for example, I have one called live that puts my digital workstation her audio workstation rather in the upper left, her show notes in the upper right, her chat in the lower left and audio hijack and nice cast in the lower right for when she's doing her show. She says, and then it banishes Chrome over to my non-primary monitor. So I don't see the hangout video. She says, it's also really useful when doing video screencasting critical to get windows, not to jump around uh, if you stop recording and then go back later to continue. That's very true. Yeah. If you've got something that's, you know, targeting a very specific section of the screen using an app like Moom or stay or any of those to sort of narrow in and make sure that, your windows are in exactly the same spot saves a lot of headache. So thanks for that. That's um, I, I love, I love the guys at many tricks. Rob Griffiths uh, was the founder of Mac OS 10 hints before, uh, before he left that and started many tricks and started. So Dave, I got a quick one. Yeah. Cause it on. just happened today. Yeah. So um, shortly before the show, I noticed that there was a, uh, a van for my cable company. Uh, outside of my house and I'm like hmm, okay that's interesting and then just as I'm about to start the show I see the guy pull out a ladder and climb the pole and start fiddling and I'm like you know what I bet I know what's going to happen <laughs> sure enough Dave and I are doing our pre-show and all of a sudden the light on my arrow goes red and the lights start flashing on my cable modem and of course um, no more John yeah so apparently he it, it, I assume he was adding a new station or connection or something like that he was he was fiddling with some cable thing but anyway so i got knocked offline how did i know that dave other than the lights and all that stuff here well and the fact that we weren't talking to each other anymore yeah and then skype was going boop boop yeah exactly um but when i checked my email later on dave um which i could have done then but i didn't um 
uptimerobot.com. So basically, I have right here, Dave, um, 4.06 p.m., Uptime Robot says, hey, your, uh, your DDNS is down. And at 4.08 p.m., it said, yep, it's back up. So huh. just thought I'd mention them. I, cool. I signed up with them at one time, and I almost don't think about it because 99.9% .9 of the time, my connection's up. But um, I guess this pings it in 30-second intervals. And, uh, if and it is Uptime you. Robot an app you run, like, on your Mac? No, it's a, it's a website. Oh, it it come, it pings you, not you pinging it. Correct. And then if oh, something's nice. wrong, it sends you an email. Huh. Cool. Um, I get that from my uh, from my disk stations, but it but it I it, didn't it, get a disk station. Alert. No, I, I was going to say thing. you wouldn't have. You'd have to be offline for like a half hour for your disk station to start <gasps> okay. complaining. Oh, that's interesting. Huh. So, I um I have a thing box, and I wonder if that would be a little more aggressive about it. We'll talk more about the thing box in another show. I'll test that before we do. Hey, yeah. um, I was, a, I was a proud Papa at the airport yesterday, John. We, uh, how, how, huh? Well, we, we went through, uh, you know, getting, uh, checking in, going through security. Uh, mm. I, I paid for TSA pre-check for me a couple of years ago. Yeah. And generally these days when, uh, they've, they've really limited down sort of the, the extra people that they just randomly give pre-check to. But uh, when I book a reservation, they generally give it to me and, and everybody else on the reservation. So, and, and that's, yeah, I happened. traveled with you once and I got it and it yeah. was like, wow, this is yeah. how it should be. This is how it should be. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. So, the, yeah, you're welcome. So the, the, the four of us had pre-check, we go through and my son was in front of me and he's, he's almost 16. He's taller than I am now. So, you know, it's a strapping can. young lad there. Yeah. They're not so young anymore. Not so My young. goodness. Yep. So he, uh, they asked him, they said, you know, he put all his stuff in the thing. He knows what to do. It worked fine. He went through the metal detector. No problem. And they said, oh, uh, do you have a cell phone? And he said, mm -hmm. yeah. And he said, but it's in my bag. They're like, right. No, when it comes through, it's just a random check that uh, the machine beeped. So you were randomly selected. We just want to take your cell phone and like wipe it down and, you know, make sure there's no uh, explosive Explo residue. Okay. Yeah. So they, they swab it and put and it in. They wanted to swab it. And he agreed to this. And huh. so I saw him and, you know, he, he, once his bag made it through to the other side of the thing, uh, he pulled his cell phone out and handed it to him and, and gave it back. And then as we were walking away, he's like, oh yeah, I got to reset my, uh, my, my touch ID, I got to type in my password. I'm like, why is that? He's like, well, as I grab my cell phone out of the bag, I hit the uh, lock button five times to turn off touch ID. He's like, I don't have anything on there. I want to hide, but I didn't want them to be able to force me <laughs> to unlock my phone. And, and, and he's right because they can force you to so, use touch ID or face ID, but they cannot force you um, to divulge information that, you know, Oh, well, hold on. So number one, what was the, the action? Oh yeah. So it's the five, touch five presses of the, uh, lock button on your phone. Now, before you do that, wait, the lock button, which is the, well, it's not the volume button. Um, the, the power button. Yeah, you can call that the power button. Sure. So if I hit that five times, wait, wait, wait. Gonna... before you do that, okay. here's the thing, though. Go into settings, go into emergency SOS uh, on your iPhone 10. You, oh, because that. Uh, oh, it activates a 911 call. It right? can. There is an option in here called and this is on everything. All right. Uh, emergency called, SOS. So I'm in emergency SOS and it says rapidly click the sleep wake button five times to quickly call emergency services. Correct. And but, auto call is off. Okay, if auto call is off, then what you'll get is a screen that comes up that allows you to swipe to, to call emergency. If auto call is on, uh, it will start calling right away. Or yeah. if you have the timer set, it will count down three seconds and then it will call emergency services. So just before you start experimenting with this, be be aware. On the iPhone 10, you get one additional option. Um, the emergency SOS gesture on this is to press and hold one of the volume buttons. It doesn't matter which and the lock slash side button, whatever you want to call that, just hold them down and then it will go into the same mode. And you can, the, the extra option on the iPhone 10 is you can choose for it also to work with five clicks. Five clicks is a little bit of a, uh, 
it's a weird motion to do. It's much more right. natural to just squeeze the two. I mean, the other head scratchers that while I thought that if you were coming from outside the U.S. into the U.S., even if you were a U.S. citizen, then they could mm. rifle yeah, they could. through your data. But if you're traveling domestically, I don't think they can demand to look through your Correct. Correct. And he data. said he said he had this in mind from his trip to and from China earlier this year. Where there may have been a threat of that. Sure. And so uh, so I was, I was proud. I'm like, oh, that's pretty smart, man. Pretty good. Okay. Yeah. So a, a child was not actually born but uh no a child yes no it was i i was just a proud papa okay. not a proud new papa right that makes sense because you, yeah. you taught your boy rat right yep to so trust no one try there that's exactly right yes that's right we've watched the x-files man it's good stuff. Hey, I do have one other. I know the band's playing and all that good stuff. But uh, I have one other thing to remind everyone of. We've talked about it on the show. But if you are, if, if you want to print or, or send a PDF of, say, an email uh, to someone else, right? Like we wanted to, I don't know, we take, we had, while we were away this weekend, Somebody made a reservation for something and it was like a multi-page email. So taking a screenshot of it wouldn't have worked uh, because you wouldn't get all the pages. And we wanted to send a PDF. But, you know, that's it, like that's not an obvious thing to do on the iPhone. The way you do it is you say print. So it was this was on Lisa's phone. She said print. Or maybe it was my daughter's phone, actually. Doesn't matter. Uh, print and then go to preview the print. And then if it's a 3D touch capable phone, you can 3D touch on the preview. Or if it's not, you can just pinch, uh, pinch out to zoom. And as soon as you do that, you'll get a different screen that has a sharing button on it. And when you choose share, you can say share it in messages. And it sends that preview PDF uh, via whatever message you, uh, you want. So there you go. That's how it's done. It's pretty good. Ah. <sighs> All right, now we've uh, we've told you all how to contact us. You can find us on Twitter. Go to twittercom slash We uh, are happy to take your questions there. Although a much better place for your questions these days is Facebook because everybody gets to see them. So go to macgeekab.com slash Facebook and you can ask questions there. But we're happy to take things anywhere. We uh, we like to hear from everybody. It's kind of how we uh, how we roll, John, huh? I think. Right. Um, hey, we I'm, even rock it old school by offering you this thing called a telephone number. To oh, call me. we do. That's right. And last I checked, Dave, the number is 206. Nope. Oh, no, 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 no. Hold on. Wait, 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 wait. Let me let me uh, let me let me get in reverse. Okay. You could call 224-888 Geek Dave, which is 4335. Almost made it. Uh, I want to thank everybody at Cashfly Hosting, C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you, of course. And then I want to thank our sponsors, which uh, are Harry's at Harry's dot com slash M-G-G. BB Edit from Barebones Software at Barebones.com. Stamps.com, where you click uh, the microphone and type MGG for your free trial deal. you got to check that out, by the way. Really, it's good stuff. Uh, I want to thank Otherworld Computing at MaxSales.com. It's good stuff. There's some more coming, too. Plex. Plex.tv slash redeem, I believe. Check the uh, check MacGeekab.com slash sponsors. That's where you can find everything. And we really appreciate it when you visit our sponsors and just check them out. Uh, if you decide to buy, that's great. But but really, it's our job to get you to check them out. And then it's up to them and you from there. So MacGeekab.com slash sponsors. John, I'm rambling. You're rambling, but you have a right to, Dave. I think um, so. Because, you know, you told us a little story here. And it made me very happy. Because he went to the airport... You had your son. He's on the ball. And the good thing, Dave, is that he made sure that he didn't get caught. Made up.